Okay, um, so I'm uh, going to uh, speak now a little bit about um, the dynamic uh, behavior of uh, masonry uh, arches. And uh, you'll see that some of this sort of builds on some of the work uh, that I discussed uh, yesterday, particularly in terms of our approach to how we tried to um, address this issue. Uh, and uh, essentially, this is trying to look at the assessment of bridges for, for real uh, trains. Uh, the guidance at the time uh, basically required either a full dynamic analysis or a static analysis where you would then apply uh, dynamic amplification factors. Uh, the dynamic amplification factors, as they exist uh, in the UIC uh, guidance, uh, basically uh, it's based on simply supported beams, um, and it's fundamentally not really appropriate for, for arches. Uh, and uh, the, other, the other sort of side to it is that it's also uh, very overly conservative. Um, so I just have a sort of small illustration here of uh, fundamental mode shapes for, for a beam, fundamental mode shapes for an arch, uh, different behavior, and I'll touch on, touch on a few, few, few more things along those lines a bit later. So, uh, so the sort of the two sort of main components of how we looked at this were um, a desktop study and a literature review, uh, what was out there already, uh, and then we also carried out um, an experimental study, uh, basically because there there wasn't really actually a lot of experimental data available for us to lean on uh, with regard to the dynamic behavior of masonry arches. So uh, so this sort of summarizes uh, some of the, the the guidance as it exists. Uh, these are basically your uh, your dynamic factors. Uh, and they're broken down into a dynamic factor, uh, which is essentially ass assuming perfectly smooth uh, track conditions, uh, and then a dynamic uh, factor that uh, accounts for the vertical track irregularities. Essentially, you add the two of them together to get your overall dynamic factor, add it to one, and multiply uh, your static uh, live loads by that value. Uh, you also need to incorporate um, a, a, a de determinate length into, uh, into your equations for looking at um, the dynamic factor and uh, this, uh, this speed parameter that's used, uh, k. And this determinate length is uh, essentially, this is a value that's been derived for beams. And uh, the approach for dealing with arches is simply um, to convert the arch to an equivalent uh, simply support a beam. And there's no real rationale for this. Uh, and when looking at beams, uh, the determinant length is uh, based on, on the influence line uh, of the member. And uh, when you look at this for a masonry arch, it still doesn't, doesn't really apply to, to what the equivalent influence line would be for an arch. So there's no real uh, connection between the theory that's been developed uh, and based on, on the simply support a beam behavior and the approach that's then taken in the guidance in relation to, to arches. Uh, so something of a theme for arches, you can trace things back to the original work, uh, but somewhere along the line, the connection between uh, the sort of the sound theory and how it's applied to, to arches uh, gets lost. Um, so arches are, uh, they're, they're, they're generally stiffer than beam structures. Uh, they have different mode shapes. Uh, they're massive structures. They're heavily damped, um, and they're also quite difficult to excite. So really, uh, fundamentally, uh, quite different. So uh, the next thing then is that we uh, looked into uh, the origins of the guidance uh, for the beam structures in a little bit more detail. Um, and these, uh, these were essentially in documents um, from the 1950s up to 1970 uh, that were put together by the um, Office of Research and Experiments, which is essentially sort of a subgroup uh, within, within the UIC. Um, and uh, this this work was really very nice. Uh, it's a combination of um, <coughs> experimental data, numerical data, uh, and then empirical curves that are, that are fit to these. Um, and the, the recommendations that come out of uh, these documents, uh, these D23 determination of dynamic forces and bridges documents, uh, they're, uh, they're very similar uh, to the recommendations that are then in the UIC 776 document. Uh, but they're not identical. So uh, again, there's a little bit of a, a lost transition from one set of documents uh, to the next. So uh, 
these are some of the models that they, that they looked at, uh, sort of very simple models with a moving point load, uh, the British Railways model um, with uh, masses uh, on springs on a deformed track, um, and then the, the Czech model with um, a sprung vehicle mass carried by uh, unsprung axle masses, again on a, a, a deformed track uh, on springs. Uh, and they compared these theoretical results um, against some of their experimental data these sort of points that you can see here. The experimental data was a combination. Again, it was you know, quite good. It was a combination of, uh, of uh, large-scale uh, tests, small-scale tests, and uh, existing structures. So really quite a bit of information there. And then they, they essentially fit, fit a curve to that. So uh, this sort of summarizes uh, the outputs of those documents. And basically, uh, what you have here are the different curves for uh, your experimental and your theoretical uh, values. Uh, this is the curve that they fit for their experimental data. This is the curve that they uh, fit to their theoretical models. This one, then, is the, the, the most simple uh, model that they considered. It's the first one on the previous slide. Uh, and essentially, uh, you can see it's that sort of uh, dynamic behavior. So uh, you don't want to accidentally miss out and hit one of the spots uh, in between one of those, those humps. Uh, so essentially, they, uh, uh, for the overall final uh, guidance document, they basically just fit fit a curve to the, to the peak uh, of all of those uh, separate bumps um, and uh, derived an empirical relationship for it. Uh, and basically, that red line uh, plots out the, the, the current equation uh, as it stands in the guidance. Uh, they then, of course, sort of set a maximum value to it, so it, uh, it does plateau off at the top. Uh, but that's strictly the curve that you get from that, that relationship. And so that's just sort of a comparison of what uh, came out of all of that work and how it was uh, arrived at. Um, and then the next thing that we did is we uh, tried to look at the, the, the data uh, that, that was uh, already existing and available um, and to see, uh, to see what we could, we could learn from it and could we, could we build on it in some way. So we managed to source uh, three sets of data uh, from, our, from the work group. Um, Bill provided some data, uh, Network Rail uh, provided some data with um, variable speeds, um, and then Jose also provided uh, some data for, for some bridges um, uh, in Spain uh, looking at uh, LVDT uh, uh, responses. Uh, in general, the sort of the overall uh, sort of conclusions from it was that there was little or no free vibration response uh, visible in the data. Uh, and that there was bridge rec recovery uh, after the bogies uh, traversed, traversed the structures. Um, this is just sort of uh, one, one example of some of the, the data that we received. Uh, this was the network rail data. Uh, this was probably, for our purposes, uh, the one that um, was probably the most relevant and interesting, essentially, because they had uh, deflection and acceleration data at a series of variable speeds. Um, and really, there wasn't, uh, there was different, different peak values for the deflection, uh, but you couldn't really uh, discern uh, any major dynamic uh, amplification effects uh, within that data. So uh, the next thing that we did then was to try and explore some uh, very, very simple uh, beam uh, models uh, using, using a finite element Analysis, again, uh, essentially to look at uh, the behavior of uh, simple beams versus uh, the behavior uh, of arches. We just, we just looked uh, at the arch itself, so we didn't, uh, we didn't incorporate the fill uh, into these simple models. And basically, we sort of compared uh, their responses. Uh, so again, just at the top is sort of repeating the, 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 the fundamental mode shapes. Uh, and then to sort of <laughs> emphasize the difference between uh, behavior for beams and arches, at the bottom, uh, it's basically uh, the static and transient um, mid-span deflections for the model uh, for, for different, uh, different speeds uh, that have all sort of been normalized against the critical speed. Uh, and basically, you can see that you're looking at sh a quite different behavior. So really, that's just to, to emphasize that the, the current approach uh, really isn't, isn't valid for arches. So if we then sort of 
go back to this, uh, this sort of overall uh, curve looking at the uh, dynamic amplification factor uh, phi dash uh, versus this uh, speed parameter uh, k, which is the ratio of your, uh, your velocity to your crit critical velocity. Uh, that's, the, that's the one that exists in the equation. Uh, this is uh, the theory that it's based on, the beam model. And then uh, these are the results from our uh, simple uh, beam element arch model. Uh, so you can see uh, it's just it's quite different, and uh, you don't you don't approach anywhere near the same levels of dynamic amplification that you do for the beam model. We uh, then. Uh, decided to make things a little bit more complicated and uh, look at some transient analyses using our uh, 3D nonlinear models. Uh, we were going to carry out experimental tests later on, uh, so what we decided to do was to uh, just do some exploratory work with the 3D models that we had that we'd already validated against uh, static uh, uh, conditions. And uh, that was basically the, the, the deflection data and the, uh, the crack patterns. Um, and to essentially sort of use these models to sort of try and investigate what sort of levels of dynamic amplification uh, you might expect for a masonry arch. Uh, so we went sort of back to um, Griffith Bridge and Greenfield Bridge. And essentially, this is sort of the, the setup for our transient model, uh, basically uh, running a truck uh, over, over the bridge along that uh, load path at different speeds. Um, so, uh, in order to sort of uh, to, to sort of pick out the, the speeds that we wanted to target, um, and also to sort of uh, establish our integration time steps, we needed to first do a modal analysis and uh, look at the, the frequencies of the, of the bridge. Uh, and so, on the basis of those 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 frequencies, we could then uh, uh, choose our integration time steps and our frequencies of interest, uh, and essentially. Uh, Run, run the analyses at these frequencies and look at the uh, dynamic amplification factors that we got. So these are the dynamic amplification factors that we got for a couple of different uh, points on the bridge. We looked at um, the haunches and we looked at the crown. Uh, this is the value uh, from the codes using this uh, the determinant length that's specified for masonry arches, which is equal to um, uh, half the span of the arch. Uh, this is, uh, if you substitute in, this isn't in the guidance at all, uh, but if you substituted in the full span of the arch, uh, which would be more related to the, uh, the premise that they say that the determinant length is meant to be determined on the influence line for the arch, uh, you would get this curve here. So still not theoretically really related to the arch, um, but it brings you down to uh, values that are uh, a little bit less <laughs> ludicrously uh, over conservative for the structures being considered. So we went through the same process again with uh, Greenfield Bridge, uh, and again, basically just sort of very, very similar findings that essentially it looks like this, this, uh, this approach is excessively uh, conservative for arches. So uh, we then uh, we then went out into the into the field uh, and we monitored uh, two bridges and their response uh, to crossing uh, trains and we monitored both the ambient response and uh, the the live load response um, and then we post processed the time histories uh, to look at the natural frequencies the mode shapes uh, and the peak responses. Um, uh, Adrian talked yesterday sort of about using. Uh, dynamic monitoring to, to look at um, damage detection, uh, a similar approach, but we weren't really looking uh, to sort of uh, bring it as far as damage detection. All we really wanted out of this was dynamic characteristics so that we could uh, validate our models and uh, essentially look at a much broader range of speeds uh, than we could actually capture out on site with the existing trains. So uh, this is one of the structures. It's uh, it's on uh, it's in Dublin, uh, down near the Grand Canal Dock. It's actually on the the oldest railway line in the country, from uh, Dublin to what was uh, Kingston and is now Dunleary. Uh, it's rather beautifully built. It's a it's a skew bridge um, constructed from from ashlar granite. So uh, really a very nice structure. Um, and then uh, along the same railway line, but uh, slightly more modern, uh, 
going further south than, than, than Dunleary. Uh, we also instrumented uh, this bridge here, uh, UBR 120 uh, in Kalini. Um, and with this one, basically, we did a number of configurations uh, for, for the accelerometers, uh, basically trying to squeeze as much as we could out of the six accelerometers we had available to us. So we then sort of uh, looked at the, the acceleration data that we got under, under the passing trains. Uh, most of them were sort of DART or uh, light, light commuter rail uh, 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 trains. And uh, we then uh, post-processed these to, to pull, out the, um, pull out the different uh, frequencies uh, for the structure. So uh, these were the ones that were uh, uh, excited under the live loads, so these aren't the ones from the, the ambient uh, data, and basically we compared them with our uh, numerical model. You can see quite good uh, matches, um, so we felt we were starting off somewhere on the right foot. Uh, we did update our model to sort of fine tune this a little bit, um, uh, primarily uh, by updating the, the, the fill stiffnesses. So just this just gives a very quick uh, illustration of the, the, the first bending mode. I'm not sure if I can get that to play. There we go. Um, obviously, with the, with the fill removed, we did include the fill in the model, but this is just looking at the, the arch barrel. Uh, and uh, you can see that this, this set of results for this bridge um, uh, look a little bit different, maybe a little bit more uh, like what you would expect. Um, and uh, this was because we were able to more uh, accurately target the frequencies that were associated with the modes that were being excited under the, the live loading. Um, and so you can see that it's, uh, it's a little bit more peaky and variable. We also ran more analyses for this one um, because this was the one that we had uh, real data for. Um, and if I sort of flick back to one of the other ones, uh, I should probably just say that this is, this is a slightly poor representation of our results. Uh, all of these dots have been connected with straight lines. In reality, you would expect um, quite a bit of variation uh, between them. Um, it just makes it a little bit easier to see when you connect up the data points. But realistically, they probably shouldn't be represented like that. Um, so just coming back to uh, the, the data from the, the bridge that we did have, uh, uh, field uh, dynamic data for. Uh, again, you can see uh, you can see just how uh, overly conservative the the existing approach uh, was. Um, you can see here that you're getting a little bit closer to uh, to a value that a a different determinant length based on the full span uh, would give you. Um, but again, well below. Uh, the values for the simply supported um, beam approach. Uh, these, these lines here from the code, uh, they're cut off at this, this value here, which uh, basically is at 200 um, kph. So you can only really apply these dynamic amplification factors at speeds uh, below this. Uh, but we also ran assessments at higher speeds um, uh, to look at the effects. And basically, uh, if, you, if you did need to consider speeds in that range under the current guidance, uh, you would need to drop the, uh, the approach using the dynamic amplification factors. And you would, you would then be in the position where you did need to do a, a transient analysis. So the, sort of the general uh, conclusion uh, was that the, the guidance was extremely conservative, uh, that bridges shouldn't uh, be condemned based on the UIC um, dynamic amplification factors that are, are applied to static loads. Uh, the test data that we have, which is extremely limited, um, uh, indicates that there's no uh, major dynamic amplification. Uh, the fundamentals of dynamic principles uh, do apply. Uh, the loads do need to be moving um, quickly enough uh, and at the right frequencies to excite the bridge. Uh, and the two bridge simulations uh, that we undertook uh, and from looking at the, the various different data that we did have uh, indicated that the value of 0.1 for, for phi dash uh, would still be conservative uh, for, for masonry arch bridges, so much, much lower value. Uh, the, 
the, uh, the guidance document that, that came out of the work group that everybody's referred to does, does contain uh, some, some updated uh, guidance on this uh, that follows the, the fundamentals of uh, structural dynamics. Um, and there's just a few sort of sample shots of what's there. Uh, much of it will look very familiar uh, from the sort of the basics uh, that you might have covered uh, when you were learning about dynamics. Um, so, so this is really a fairly, fairly simple and straightforward uh, approach. Um, so uh, the sort of the overall conclusions is that the, the, the pre-existing approach is very conservative. Uh, the appendix in the new uh, documents uh, is designed to address this. Uh, and really that the most robust solution uh, is not to, to, to apply these, uh, these uh, dynamic factors, uh, but the most robust solution is to conduct a full uh, dynamic analysis. Uh, but the other big conclusion is that really uh, substantive, substantive further research is, is really required in this area. Uh, the dynamics of masonry and arch bridges is something that really hasn't been looked at uh, in a huge amount of um, detail. Um, I was going to leave my presentation there, uh, but um, after talking to a number of people after uh, yesterday's uh, session, um, I suppose some of the feedback uh, was that um, we perhaps presented a, a view of the work as um, one being slightly out of date <laughs> um, <clears throat> and not forward looking. Uh, and uh, also we sort of painted a slightly uh, dour picture in terms of uh, there being enough information available to people uh, to sort of really uh, learn about arch, arch behavior and um, sort of get to grips with um, some of the fundamentals uh, behind the different analyses and assessment methods. Um, so I'm just going to uh, very quickly look at um, some of the some of the directions that um, things might go in the future. Um, obviously, there's a huge broad range of uh, different technologies uh, relating to, to bridge monitoring um, more generally. Um, and a number of these will, will, will find their way into uh, masonry arch uh, bridge monitoring uh, and ultimately uh, into, into their, their, their assessment methods. Um, so I'll just uh, very briefly um, uh, talk a tiny little bit about work that um, it's not related to uh, masonry arch bridges that I've been doing, but it's very much related to uh, looking at the dynamic response of structures. Uh, and this is basically uh, some shots from uh, a big fiber optic instrumentation and monitoring scheme that I was involved with um, up near Stafford as part of a big uh, railway upgrade. And uh, it uh, basically we were instrumenting steel uh, and concrete bridges with uh, fiber optic uh, strain sensors and temperature sensors. Uh, and the really nice thing about the strain sensors uh, is that essentially you can sample them at a very, very high rate. So we're able to sample up at around um, 1,000 hertz. Uh, so this basically brings you into to the range where you can effectively uh, take a strain monitoring system uh, and effectively uh, get the sort of data that you would normally need a separate dynamic monitoring system for uh, and essentially combine your strain monitoring uh, with your dynamic monitoring. Uh, so obviously there's huge potential uh, for applying uh, this sort of technology um, to the the, the, the issues around uh, the dynamic response of masonry arches that I was just talking about uh, and collecting uh, the sort of data that's needed to explore that in more detail. And the other benefits are that it's, uh, you're able to sort of instrument uh, the structures in a, in a much greater level of detail that's not done with more traditional uh, strain monitoring or dynamic monitoring systems. You're essentially able to get a lot more data points uh, onto your structure. Um, but there are, there are definitely sort of challenges associated with it. Uh, my main interests in this um, haven't really been on masonry arches. It's been more focused on trying to get this sort of technology uh, implemented into structures at the outset of their life. Um, so I've been very interested in sort of following the trend between um, off-site to, con con sorry, on-site construction to 
off-site manufacture with on-site assembly and essentially trying to translate that to, uh, to sensing as well. Um, so this sort of last picture on the right is basically a photo of some uh, sleepers that we instrumented in a Semex factory and basically were able to deliver on-site pre-instrumented and ready to basically plug in and go. Uh, this is really nice and easy for the concrete elements. We're able to do that um, uh, quite well. It's obviously more challenging uh, for other types of elements, such as steel elements. And then again, is going to be more challenging for uh, structures like uh, masonry arches, uh, where there is no offsite and the arch isn't sort of sitting somewhere neat and tidy, ready to be lifted, lifted onto its abutments like a steel bridge uh, might be. Um, but there is there is being uh, work being done uh, with this type of sensing uh, for masonry arches. And Matt Young's group uh, are carrying out work in that area. Uh, so really, the, the sort of data sets that you're going to get, uh, particularly in relation to dynamic monitoring, uh, are going to become much, much richer for arches. Um, and I'll just sort of give you um, a quick illustration of, um, of the sort of uh, real-time data that you can um, get out of these systems. These were, this was for one of the bridges up in Stafford. That's basically your sensor. And that's the strain data that you can get in live real time as the bridge uh, runs over the bridge. Or sorry, as the train <clears throat> runs over the bridge. Um, so that's just one example of things looking forward. There's tons of tons of other uh, technologies that are that are going to come into play uh, and keep masonry arch bridge uh, monitoring and assessment uh, up to date. Um, Bill referred to a lot of work with uh, with, with with photogrammetry. Uh, there's all sorts of um, possibilities there with other uh, imaging techniques as well. Uh, and then finally, just, uh, just sort of on the point about uh, information about masonry arches being, being very uh, inaccessible. Um, I think if you sort of look, uh, look back to the roots a little bit more, some of the older uh, documents uh, are written, one in a style that's uh, much more accessible, um, but it can also sort of uh, strip away uh, some of the, uh, I suppose, some of the complexities that, uh, that we tend to look at uh, in more detail now. Uh, I suppose one of the, uh, one of the, the, the biggest uh, and most important uh, developments in uh, the analysis of masonry and arch bridges has been this, uh, this plastic approach, uh, so the, the approach that's basically um, behind uh, Bill and Matthew's uh, methods in Archie uh, and Ring. And uh, you can sort of look back at uh, the work that uh, Jacques Hyman did, did uh, on that. Uh, but uh, I think the, the, the thing that's perhaps even more accessible and that most people will actually have quite a bit of uh, experience and familiarity with is uh, to take one step back further uh, and to look at uh, the plastic plastic analysis as it uh, as it applies to steel frames. Uh, so most people will have done uh, the design of uh, portal steel frames for big sheds and warehouses, uh, and uh, and the theory that this is based on you know plastic theory where you look at uh, hinge formation. Uh, is uh, is really uh, where that uh, plastic uh, theory as applied to arches uh, came from. Uh, and that was the thing that was really exciting about uh, Jacques Hyman's work, uh, was that he essentially took uh, the plastic analysis methods for steel structures uh, and applied them to masonry, a, a material that everybody felt uh, was completely inappropriate for, for considering as a plastic material. Um, but if you kind of if you make that 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 one step further back, uh, it's probably much much more uh, accessible and much more in line with the type of work that most people have uh, have done. So just to um, give sort of a very uh, brief illustration of this. So this is basically, uh, this is a video that still gets um, shown to the, the second year engineers in, um, in Cambridge. It's, uh, this is how they're introduced to, to plastic theory. 
uh, and it's basically a, a video of uh, Lord Baker uh, demonstrating uh, plastic theory as applied to his design of uh, the Morrison uh, bomb shelter. So this is a little scale model of it. Um, and I'll just uh, show you the video. We're going to put a is that too loud? shelter or two in. Let's put that little man in. This is how they work. Nice. Put another chap in with him. <laughs> and just to show you that I'm quite confident about this, uh, here's my gold watch and chain. Here's my gold watch. Now, so drop the box. Well, you see, things wouldn't have been so bad. First of all, I'll take my watch out. That's quite all right. And then we can take out the shelter and the shelters. Well, it's behaved exactly as we designed it to behave. It's deflected 12 inches, and everything inside was perfectly all right. Yeah. And I've learned from uh, yesterday I need to stop the YouTube video. <laughs> um, okay, but if I just um, scroll to the very end of it um, and hold it there, uh, I suppose, you know, really this, this is ish. It's the plastic hinges, one, one two, three, uh, in this case. Uh, and really, this is, this is exactly the same thing uh, when you're considering arches. Obviously, you're looking for the fourth hinge. Uh, in order to get uh, to get collapse, uh, but uh, but in terms of the actual sort of theory and principles um, behind it, uh, you know th this is this is really where it's where it's all coming from. Um, it's probably uh, really a, a nice easy place to start, um, and then possibly to look at uh, Jacques Hyman's work, where he just basically talks about the assumptions that are needed in order to apply it to masonry arch structures. Uh, and how, how it kind of comes into play with the line of thrust. Uh, and uh, that, really, that really underpins so much of current practice uh, with masonry arch assessment uh, that that probably is, has the greatest potential for, um, for pr providing insight uh, in, in that area. Um, so hopefully that presents a slightly more positive, <laughs> um, positive picture. Uh, and I'll, I'll end on that and let everybody away to the tea and coffee.